conference organizers uh, selected an interesting subject for me to speak about. That is how not to speak, not to stop the far right. Well, everybody was uh, concentrating on uh, the fight to stop the uh, far right. In Turkey, it's exactly true that they are, they are almost a comedic a particle bay uh, in struggle not to for, not to stop the far right. In any case, we live in a very strange world, not only in Turkey, but across the world. In the United States, the two uh, candidates are Trump and Biden. That's all, almost uh, summarizes the situation in the uh, political debate in the free world. It's not enough, of course, there is on the uh, counter side is the Putin, Alexander Lukashenko and Zelensky on the other side. And consider the, what's happening in democratic Europe. Boris, Truss and Sunak in your country, Macron in your neighborhood, Meloni in Italy and in Germany, up, up and coming out for Deutschland, in Hungary, Orban, and uh, barely elected Duda in the uh, last two uh, presidential elections in Poland. These are the dominant figures in the uh, European and world scale. So nationalism, racism, anti-immigrant hatred, and so-called family values, that is against women's rights, against LGBTR rights, and a very rabid campaign against anti-abortion abortion. And on top of that, anti-Russian and anti-Chinese stance all around the world. So we can also add an important aspect of this world and Islamophobic politics, which is based on xenophobia and neo-colonialist white supremacy culture. And uh, across the world, in your region, right-wing organizations are getting very strong within the state apparatus, especially in the armed forces, and there's not much measures taken against these developments. And on top of that, the blanket control over the mass media is almost total. I'm not talking about the uh, Sahel region from uh, Mauritania to Ethiopia. And there are wars going on longer than the Algerian liberation war now. And no result is coming. Forthcoming. In in our neighborhood, in our region, and warring going on between Russia and Ukraine. We have uh, talked about it uh, well, in the recent months uh, with the Russians withdrawal from the uh, Black Sea grain corridor. And they started to bomb the grain exporting uh, and storage facilities in the southern ports of Ukraine and the major ports actually around Odessa region. And that was not enough because now the uh, Ukraine is trying to force a road or route from uh, Bulgarian coast and Romanian coast to the Danube uh, river ports. Al although they are small, but they can take up some of the strain. And Russians bombed those main three ports. As you see, as you hear, the helicopters are flying over Istanbul nowadays. Well, the, the uh, Danube ports were destroyed. And when the Ukraine and Turkey tried to force the Black Sea coast, Postal route from on the uh, Bulgarian and Romanian uh, coast a couple of days ago, Russians stopped a Turkish ship and uh, by military force, naval force, and searched. So they are saying that clearly that this is not going to work. 
So in the uh, northern borders of Turkey, a war is going on and Turkey is trying to present itself as uh, non-participant and uh, a kind of mediation force to bring peace in the region. But of course it fails because it's, it's also had strange relations with Russian oligarchs and as well as the Ukrainian president. And Turkey is today's aviation industry, which is becoming rather famous because of its drones, is dependent on the Ukraine's technology. So in the north, the situation is like that. In the northeastern border, Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan is still fighting a war. Although there's a truce now, but uh, the conditions of truce are not complied with. And the Azerbaijani side stops traffic on the Lachin corridor to Karabakh region and uh, forcing the Armenian hands to open the Zangezor corridor along the Iranian border, which is a very disputable uh, development since it uh, creates a barrier between Azerbaijan, Armenia, and uh, Russia for the Iranian side. So Iran is vehemently against this Zangezor corridor. But Turkey, and of course behind Turkey, the United States is forcing the issue. And Georgia is half of it almost occupied by Russia, is still uh, trying to uh, balance its position within those fighting or rival factions. If you come to the uh, southern borders of Turkey, you know the uh, never ending story of Syria, Iraq and Iran. And of course, the central issue is that Kurdistan. What kind of a Kurdish solution would be forthcoming in the uh, new era? And uh, it is a region where USA and Russia and Iran and the Gulf countries are competing with each other and keeping private armies or forces attached to them to uh, implement their aims. A recent development is that uh, Russians uh, and Americans are uh, trying to change positions in the Iran, Iraq Syrian border. And the US is trying to build up a new force, a force from the Arab tribal forces to defend the Deir el Zor region or the southern border of Iran and Iraq, and uh, sorry, Iraq and Syria, and maintain a new uh, control on the region through another proxy group. And it, it seems that they have difficulties with the Kurdish forces because they are not, the United States is not complying with their agreement with Kurds to uh, stop Turkish incursions in the uh, Kurdish control zones. And uh, when the Turkish armed forces occupy a land, they tend not to get out of it. In 1938, uh, Antioch province or region of old Syria was occupied by the Turks and uh, annexed in the new course, became in the Antakya province of Turkey or Hatay province, which was devast devastated by the recent earthquake. But Turkey has a strict control on it. Also, the, another example of Turkey's army's occupation, occupation is the uh, Northern Cyprus, of course. Now it's almost 40 odd years, nearly 50 years. Uh, there's a double two states appearing every day, more and more visible and acceptable. Even uh, some uh, MPs in the British Parliament is this issue that uh, the recognition of the Turkish Republic is a kind of inevitable 
outcome of the occupation. And uh, on the uh, Western border, with our, our relations with Greece, is uh, getting worse day by day, despite all the uh, pleasant words exchanged in the NATO meetings or European meetings, because US is trying to build up a new corridor, which is not relying on Turkey to reach Central Europe, not to pass through the uh, Turkish Straits, which is protected by the Montreal Convention, which is not allowed passage of military vessels or naval vessels uh, during the times of conflict. As a result, Turkey is not uh, allowing American and NATO ships into Black Sea right at the moment. And uh, Russia is quite happy with it, but America and uh, Ukraine are not very happy with that. They are trying to build a regular presence in the Black Sea coast with a special squadron of NATO naval forces. And in order to supply that, they developed a port in the Greece, border, Greece Turkey border, near, very, very near to the Greece and Turkey border, Alexandropolu, which we call in Turkish the Daaj. There was an old uh, small harbor, it was enlarged, and there was an Greek army base, it was transferred to the uh, Americans, and they built a road and a railroad connection to Romania, across Greece and Romania, Bulgaria and Romania. And uh, another new development in the, in the next five years, they are going to build, the United States going to build a base in one of the islands in the Aegean Sea. As you may know, Russia have, uh, United States have good bases in Crete, Soda Bay, in the mainland Greece, and now in Alexandropol. And now they want to control, they want to extend their control on the uh, Aegean. See, with a base, naval and air base in the one of the islands. They are not studying the subject. These are, of course, putting a lot of strain in the relations between Greece and Turkey, as well as Greece and United States. Because some of those islands are by uh, agreement were supposed to be demilitarized despite the fact that uh, Greece and the Americans do not regard that as a valid condition nowadays because it was an ancient, according to them, ancient clause of the treaties. And they are putting strain on the Turkish politics by forcing Turkey to revisit or revise the Montreal Convention and giving more options to NATO and US naval vessels. Turkey is of course trying to stop these developments and this strained relations with all its neighbors is putting Turkey in a very, very, Turkey's regime in a very, very precarious situation. When we are talking about how not to stop the far right, we must remember this ring of fire around Turkey. Uh, one of the influential writers of uh, Turkey's left, Oya Baydan, uh, wrote an article very recently saying that uh, we are getting accustomed to deaths of Turkish soldiers. Every week, five, six people is getting killed in occupied zones. And uh, we are so, I get, so get so accustomed to that, that situation, we cannot even raise our voices nowadays. And he, she continues that uh, the continuous war is also corrupting the Turkish society as a whole. And uh, right wing extremism is getting its substance from this. The developments. I think she was quite right in that regard because uh, historically Turkey's uh, right wing 
came from mainly from two different distinct lines. One of them is uh, Turkish nationalism, which is well off in the early uh, 20th century, especially with those uh, intellectuals coming from the Russian Turkestan and becoming part of uh, Istanbul's political elite and later became the founding fathers of Turkish Republic. They developed the idea of Tur Turkish nationalism's main tenets. And uh, since then, especially during the uh, early part of 20th century, when the Progress and Union Party of the Ottoman Empire and later the Republican Turkish Party of early Republican era adopted these policies into their programs and also into the built it into the laws and constitution of the of Turkey. So Turkey is the main political party, Atatürk's party, Republican Turkey, the Republic's People's Party has a program called Six Arrows, six main uh, points. And one of them is uh, nationalism and statism. Uh, and it became a, a pro pro party program into the first constitution. So a single party state is developed like that. So that uh, since then, the Turkish military apparatus, as well as the uh, Turkey state, the old cadres and the newly educated intellectuals are imbued with this spirit, Turkish spirit. And uh, even today, so-called patriotism or mild nationalism is accepted as a progressive thing in many circles. And in the 1960s and 70s, that problem that considering nationalism is a progressive thing was a hampering force developing of socialist ideas and programs. So you may find many traces of nationalism in the political agenda of left in, in very different disguises from Communist Party of Turkey to other legal parties as well. And uh, in the 1960s, this trend has been strengthened by the military juntas taking over from the elected governments in 1960, in 1971, in 1980, and 1993. Turkey's army intervened and uh, upside, turned upside down the uh, political process for new governments. And in 10 years' time, they, of course, uh, lost the control and uh, standard bourgeois politics came on top again. But every 10 years, they just give a kind of balance to the developments of uh, Turkish democracy. So states protection and states aims became uh, part of the nationalist idea. And uh, they are so intertwined that uh, all the uh, top brass of the Turkish army and uh, all top bureaucrats educated in the universities of the Republic of Turkey were really kind of a kind of intertwined unit defending the Turkey's interests without due course to the, uh, without the, due regard to the political process. They knew better than the rest of the world and the rest of the Turkish society what's good for Turkey. And they had the power to implement their own policies when they think that the time is opportune for uh, their intervention. This has not changed until uh, 2000. The second uh, trace of the Turkish uh, reaction or right wing is for, stem from the uh, Islamic opposition to the uh, modern development of modern development of modern bourgeois society. That is uh, the uh, 
medresa, the traditional educational society of the uh, Ottoman society, lost its position against the universities of modern Turkey, developed their own uh, underground organizations and contact with the other Islamic countries to stand against the modernization and their uh, banner was anti-laicism in Turkish. Uh, it's a term taken over from France that means anti-secularism or anti-clericism. And practically it's explained that they had the religious and uh, state affairs cannot be much and the state affairs can be controlled by the state and religious affairs should be stayed away from that. In practical terms, this means that uh, the state controls the religion. They built up a new organization called Religious Affairs Organization, and it grew and grew and grew. But today, it's, I think it's larger than some of the ministries. And uh, it, it reaches to such a level that you cannot build a mosque in Turkey or open a religious school without the permission of this uh, institution. And it's, 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 this institution is controlled by the state. So they expected to control the uh, religion through this organization. However, the things did not go well for the uh, Turkish army top brass and the bureaucrats, those who have secularist ideas about Turkey's running Turkish affairs. There was uh, one of those important events in that regard was the uh, tariqats or the brotherhoods. They were uh, organized within their own uh, hierarchy, not accepting the religious affairs ministries or departments hierarchies at all. They developed underground and practically they maintained the traditional values of Islam. When we talk about traditional values of Islam, of course, we must remember that today Ishid uh, or ISIL is also, or Taliban or Al-Qaeda are also based on the same premises, the traditional values of Islam. In Turkish case, there were several colors of traditional Islam. One of them is a famous Hafetullah Gülen movement, which is part of the former Nursi movement. They were uh, in rhetoric connected to uh, traditional Islamist values, but very, very matching order with the uh, American interests. So they get support from the United States and uh, they did, did the bidding of the United States to develop their own ideas while helping the United States. So the position of these uh, tariqats or brotherhoods, religious brothers, became a nuisance for the state. And from very early time of the uh, Republican era, the national intelligence agencies of Turkey is trying to uh, check or control the one on the one hand and right wing, on the left hand side, the Communist Party and other left wing organizations. But on the other hand, they are trying to control the Islamic Brotherhood's developments. Of course, these two uh, main stem had uh, some interesting uh, supports during the uh, last hundred years, especially after the Second World War. There was a new development. The uh, nationalist Turkish, Turkic, Turkish Center nationalist organizations got a new boost from the United States espionage network in the former Soviet Union countries, especially in the Central Asia. They took over the uh, Nazi Germany's organization illegal organization there. And there are many uh, former Russian officers serving in the Wehrmacht, the German army, 
and at the end of the war, transferred their allegiance to U.S. Army, and they became operators of the CIA in the region. And Turkey received a substantial amount of these kind of uh, officers from uh, these countries into Turkey, and uh, they were became important operators of the uh, CIA in the region. And uh, one of them is very important man, Rudy Nazar, who was developed very good contacts with the army officers with the uh, right wing tendencies, arranged their training in the uh, United States at Fort Benning. And those, were the, those officers took part in 1960 military takeover. And uh, they formed the extreme wing of the military takeover. However, they were not able to gain the full control of the organization. So they were kicked out. And for a while, they were in the uh, wild, sent to the faraway countries as ambassadors or diplomatic diplomats. And they were gradually returned back to Turkey in late 60s. And uh, when they came back, they tried to organize new junta cliques within the army or uh, without. And uh, they also organ tried to organize right-wing militia groups, Turkish nationalist militia groups, the infamous Grey Wolves, or uh, today's National Action Party's supporters, came to being through their efforts. And uh, they were kind of instrumental against the development, developing or burgeoning left forces in Turkey. And they were trained to uh, intervene with armed forces to uh, development of Turkish Workers' Party and the student movements. And uh, for late 60s and early 70s, Turkey became a battleground of Turkish left wing organizations defending themselves from the right wing attacks. During that period, religious politics had a kind of quiet time. They did not take part in the street fightings, or they did not part, take part in the big demonstrations, etc. However, they continued organizing. And uh, their, their chance came in 19, uh, late 1990s with the development of uh, traditional Islamist organizations in the Middle East and uh, generally abroad. So they became more, more, more and more prominent. And one of the prominent leaders of this movement was uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, today's president. And uh, when they uh, had their opportunities to form a, a new government, they, of course, for a while, went along. They uh, maintained a good relation with the military and the bureaucratic top, top brass, but they uh, were not openly supporting the uh, religious organizations they were supporting underneath, underhand way. But uh, the, gradually their uh, true color became more and more apparent and they tried to control the national education ministry and through them the school, the schools and the universities. So all the educational institutions became under the control of the religious side. And uh, it created a kind of tension between the Turkish nationalists and the religious fanatics. And uh, in 2016, the attempted coup was a result of this tension. Of course, America, etc., get involved in this development. But after this uh, last minute 
cool. But at the cool uh, prevented at the last minute. The Islamists realized that they were not able to control developments in Turkey alone. So a new uh, approach is accepted or assumed. That is the called uh, Turkish Islamic synthesis in Turkey. Turkish Islamic synthesis means that uh, religious fanaticism and Turkish nationalism became a one organization or single unit uh, supporting each other and uh, getting support from each other. That was the uh, main trust of the years 2000 and 2010 and even today. So uh, when they are, when the right thing is coming together like this, what happened to the Turkish left or the Turkish anti-religious uh, forces and as well as the secular uh, modernists? What happened to them? They were uh, gradually forced to accept that the uh, ascendancy of uh, Turkish Islamic synthesis in the state policies, and they gradually reduced their opposition to meaningless petty things. The main uh, leverage for the Turkish Islamic synthesis over the opposition is the Kurdish war. It, they say that the Kurdish war is a matter for uh, survival for Turkey. And as a matter of national interest, all the parties, including the opposition, must come together and form a single unit to stand against it. That works for a while. That works because the uh, main force of the opposition is Turkish Republican uh, People's Party is uh, from the very birthday has the same ideas that the state interest is above all and uh, democracy and other human rights etc. is secondary to the uh, unity and indivisibility of Turkish state. So uh, from their birthmark, we can say that uh, this or birth defect, this opposition is ailed with uh, in front of nailing in front of the nationalism. And all recent developments prove that this is, this is the case. <laughs> Whenever an anti-constitutional or anti-democratic measure is brought to the parliament, Parliament is unanimously approved. Unanimously, I mean, except the uh, Kurdish movements, members of the parliament. Apart from that, everybody agrees. Opposition and the government agrees. And they do not, they even uh, there are some uh, interesting speeches of uh, leader of the opposition. He says that, uh, I know that this is unconstitutional, but I have to support it. That's, that's so simple. He knew un unconstitutionality and the uh, undemocraticness of the uh, position, but he didn't do anything. In practical terms, they did not want to be elected against the uh, Erdogan regime because Erdogan regime is doing the bidding of the Turkish state. And uh, Official opposition is also uh, another part of the support system of the Turkish state in the parliament and in the social life in general. A new example, very recent example, is in the <laughs> last uh, election in, in May. The uh, left wing organizations try to get together and uh, form a kind of coalition against Erdogan. And with participation of the Republicans People's Party, they were 
Uh, they had a very good chance to uh, not lower the 20 year rule of Erdogan because all the opinion polls suggested that there were a meaningless amount of difference between the two sides. So a kind of push or shove might be enough to uh, topple the government or at least put it in a very, very difficult position. But Kılıçdaroğlu, uh, the leader of the opposition, did not opt to uh, win the election. After the election, it became clear that his last minute deals with uh, right-wing nationalist organizations and even uh, hidden from the uh, other coalition partners, suggests that he is not willing to get the votes from the Kurd, Kurds in the face of uh, criticism that he is supporting the PKK or the Kurdish uh, Workers' Party, main opposition party of the Kurdish armed uprising. <laughs> so he is not prepared to accept that charge or challenge. And he, he preferred not to win the election. Uh, one of the coalition partners of the left wing is the Turkish Workers' Party, a very small but influential group, vocal group. It suddenly became a uh, nuisance it in the group and said that we are not standing together as a unit. We want to stand alone and we are going to uh, put candidates in wherever we can win. And it, but they're all so last minute developments that nobody can do anything. So they did it. And now we learned that after uh, two months later, that the uh, Republican People's Party paid a large sum of money, substantial sum of money for to them to uh, develop their own campaigns. So these are all suggesting that uh, the, the opposition, despite all uh, rhetoric about uh, unity and uh, winning the elections, etc., is was not willing to win the election, was not bring the Kurds to the fore, and was not ready to accept the uh, left wing as a whole, as coalition partner. So under these conditions, we can say that the uh, Turkish left is, has done quite a good, quite a good job to maintain a, a, a resemblance of unity during the uh, election campaign and during the election as well. However, it was very obvious that uh, Turkey's land is not ready to accept or understand the whole truth of the situation or the all aspects of the situation. First of all, as I mentioned before, the kind of light nationalism, so-called patriotism, is a deliberating uh, melody of Turkey's left. And uh, They are not ready to accept or understand or comprehend the challenge before them. And before, because of that, there is no political uh, program which may uh, accept the realities of Turkey today to develop a kind of unified policy or at least joint policy to enhance or to develop their own ideas. Today, having a political party, unified political party and unified political program is not in the agenda of Turkey's left. That was the main problem. Secondly, there are still uh, dashed hopes about military might, especially in the uh, those uh, people who support Kurdish cause, because in Turkey is that one of the uh, turnusol paper of the leftingness of an organization is to look at their program or ideas about Kurdish 
freedom movement, when large sections of Turkey, Turkey's left, is not ready to cooperate with the Kurdish left or support the ideas of Kurdish left. And they regard the Kurdish left as a kind of nationalist organization looking forward to split Turkey into parts and create a new Kurdistan. And uh, the, without giving due regard to Abdullah Öcalan, suggests that this is the Öcalan's idea. Actually, Öcalan supported this idea in the early 1970s, but very quickly he realized that this was not the case. His later assessment of the situation is very clear that Turkish army cannot beat us, but we cannot win by the guerrilla force. We must be a political force in Turkey. And not only in Turkey, but also in the other uh, parts of the countries occupying Kurdistan. So that means that there are going to be a national movement in uh, Kurdistan, as well as in Iraq, Syria, Turkey, and Iran. So they have to uh, become a kind of unifying force and not a force to de develop and split within those countries from a new Kurdistan, but developing a democratic society in all those countries. Erdogan's policy is this, was this, and has been like this since 19, late 1990s. And this reality is not accepted by many on the Turkish left. So uh, they uh, blindfoldedly accept the bourgeois propaganda and uh, say that uh, they cannot cooperate with the Kurds. And on the smaller sections of the Turkish left is very ready to accept the uh, Kurdistan movement and they want to take part in the armed struggle as well. But they do not have any kind of revolutionary idea. They just like to have a kind of fighting spirit, a kind of revolt against the regime. So they do not have any political agenda on that regard. So this was a difficulty of Kurds to persuade the uh, Turkish left. Of course, the Kurds have the same problem within themselves as well. The, uh, some sections of the Kurdish freedom movement has contacts with the tribal uh, Kurdish right wing. Their all, all aim was to uh, establish a state, whatever it is, especially in the Barzani style regime in the, as it existed in the Kurdish autonomous region in the Iraqi territory. They were very happy with that kind of limited amount of success. And they think that it is better than uh, having nothing. So they do not have any inclination to support this democratization of the Turkish society or Syrian society. They, see, they think that it's a pipe dream. It's, a, it's an impossible program. So they are very happy to accept any kind of compromise so long as they have a small gain of independence or autonomy. Within the Kurdish movement, this is a, these are two different strands fighting with each other. And the Turkish bourgeoisie is far well away of these developments, better than the Turkish left. And they are decapitating, taking the leaders out who are supporting Öcalan's idea or Öcalan's program. Öcalan's program's main uh, supporter in the uh, political, legal political life was Selahattin Demirtas and he was in, uh, put in jail for trumped up charges or framed in the kind of uh, charge and put in jail and he is there for years. And even the European Court of Human Rights says that he has to be released. They are releasing it from one charge but arresting him from another charge and so the political or judicial process starts once or once more again. And they are keeping them in jail. And the other influential leaders, which are really the 
municipal leaders of the Kurdistan. They're only almost in jail and they're all elected members of the municipalities in the Kurdish region are in jail and they're replaced with the government appointed managers. And Turkey's central regime is running Turk, Kurdistan cities and the municipalities with the appointed managers. Practically, the uh, elections are useless or they are telling the Kurds that they have no chance to proceed with the democratic process. Their only option is on the mountains, fight against them and with their technical supremacy, they will be killed. Every day, five or six Kurdish guerrilla fighters, led leaders, are killed in the drone attacks or targeted assassination attempts. And in Turkey, nobody says anything because we are getting used to that. And then by doing so, the uh, Turkey state is also designing the Kurdish political parties movement's program. They, they are trying to strengthen the uh, religious as well as nationalist leaders, while they are trying to stop the internationalists and democratic opposition. And Turkey is, that is, not, is unaware of that, or whenever they are aware, they are not able to do anything about that. It is very easy to uh, see the difference, but uh, changing this reality is very, very difficult. It's not easy. It's not easy just how to understand it, but to, when you try to start, try to stop the developments or change the course, it is very, very difficult because in this region of the world, life is very cheap and easy. To kill. Today is the uh, 17th anniversary of the Iranian uh, Mossadegh regime's topple, toppling by the Americans and the British intelligence services. In 1953, the Mossadegh regime nationalized the Anglo-Iranian uh, petroleum in 1951. And in the, within two years, Mossadegh was toppled and uh, Reza Shah Pahlavi was uh, declared a king. And nowadays, it's, everybody has forgotten it. But the main trust of the killing was against the Tudeh Party, the Communist Party of Kurdistan, the Communist Party of Iran members. Thousands were killed in that, re in that 53 August days. Yasmin Mather, will be, Yasmin Mather will be able to explain better than me, she has said. But that was the start of the British-American cooperation in the region, intelligence cooperation and the intervention with the clandestine methods in the developments in the region. There, they suggested that the British intelligence was more subtle and the Americans were brutal and uh, blunt, but at the end of the day, their way of designing the Middle East brought us to here. And as I tried to explain, the same years were also development of the military juntas in Turkey and the right-wing nationalist Turkish organizations within the army and the Navy and the Air Force. So uh, with the external influence, the Turkish regime became very harsh its own population. It has always been very hard to report its population because it was established through killing Armenian and Greek, Greek uh, population of Turkey. There was a large scale ethnic cleansing, uh, genocide in Turkey and Turkish Republic based on that one. So as a result of that, the Turkish nationalism has a very peculiar tendencies. One of the peculiar tendency was to uh, ethnic cleansing is a norm because most of the uh, 
forces utilized or mobilized for ethnic cleansing were the immigrants arriving from Romania or the Balkans and the Caucasus, the Circassians, etc. Then they became Turks, modern Turks. Few uh, in a few years, they came from in, in millions from uh, two, two parts of the world and merged and replaced the Armenian Greek population and formed the new people educated in the nationalist and religious manner. So this is the uh, reality of Turkey. And within that uh, population, it was very easy for the uh, United States and the um, British and the French, etc., as well as the Russians, to build up vulnerable groups with money and with the ideology of nationalism as well as Islamism to utilize against the uh, kind of left-wing policies and the Kurds. Because the remaining problem in the ethnicity of the Turkey or Turkey's state's desire to create a unified Turkish nation was the Kurds and to a lesser extent the Alevi community. They are not uh, Orthodox Muslims, they are more akin to Shia Muslims, but their own ideas. And they are not very religious in, in the strict sense of uh, Turkey's Islamism. So uh, these are two hindrances before Turkey to develop a unified nation. So uh, since the 1980s, they're main trust is trying to build up new forces within those peoples and try to develop, try to stop any kind of resistance from those organizations. So Turkey's uh, right wing is doing all those things and uh, we on the left is trying to understand what we are trying, what we can do and what we should do. And today the uh, program, fight, fight for a program and fight for an organization has been uh, the main problem standing in before us in the uh, reaction period created by the collapse of the Soviet Union and the implosion of the socialist countries around, gathered around the Soviet Union created such a uh, disillusionment uh, left in politics, we are not able to overcome this problem yet. And uh, today there are many developments in the uh, press, etc., and in the social media, but there is no uh, unified organizational work to create a kind of political program that would encompass all the, all the political strands of the Turkish left or left of Turkey into single union or unify them in a single political agenda. That was in the belt around the country, but Feeling it clearly is not enough to develop an idea to bring out, out a new program, just, just bringing people together. Even a simple program or political election campaign is almost difficult to achieve in this fragmented world. Turkey's uh, left thing suffered since 1980s in the hands of the military juntas and the other reactionary forces, and they were not able to recover themselves in the atmosphere created by the continuous fight and continuous war in Turkey's Kurdistan. So under those conditions, there are ample opportunities to develop ideas about what to do in the 
political sense to unify fight against right wing or far right. But the main mechanism, the program and organization is lacking. When these are too lacking, the rest of the details is not very, very important. It was just a short -term, term gains or a short term losses. But the main thing is we are unable to bring together all available forces to discuss a program and to bring about a coherent point. So under those conditions, when we look around the, our, our country, the ring of fire around Turkey, we have ample opportunities to cooperate with the forces in other countries, but we cannot take this opportunity at all because we are not able to unify within ourselves. And uh, in the uh, international scene, there is no kind of joint organization or authority to bring about a kind of discussion, a kind of program, a kind of hope to the people. So all we do is just small bits and increments from there to there, and we are not able to get any positive outcome from this kind of fragmented struggle. When we talk about the fragmented struggle, whoever you ask, is it good to have a fragmented struggle? Everybody will say, no, 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 it's, we have to unite, unify it, and we have to fight together. And in the practical terms, we cannot fight together. That was the uh, main problem. The ideological supremacy of the 1970s is lost. Now we have to rebuild the ideological supremacy, program supremacy in Turkey. For example, in the, before the election, right-wing regime opened the uh, floodgates of the inflationist policies and gave this to their workers, that to uh, civil servants and the other sum of money to the producers of agriculture. And now the inflation is skyrocketed. And uh, after the election, when they won the election, they just started to turn the screws down. And uh, election is, uh, inflation is still getting higher. And uh, all the uh, prices rising, but the uh, incomes are stopped. Income rises are stopped. And everybody is crying. How this happened? You promised us that such and so. The Turkish left is not developing an idea about the economy and the struggle for better wages and conditions. <laughs> because their horizon is not passing through the uh, workplace environment. They want to get good wages from the uh, state employment and the uh, state economic enterprises. And they don't want to get involved with the uh, immigrant labor. Today in Istanbul, almost all the imitation goods industry depends on the Syrians and Afghanis. <laughs> but Turkish debt and Turkish trade unions do not develop a policy towards that. They are talking about the price rises <clears throat> and demand wage rises from, from the government. There are a few strikes in the uh, private sector, private economic enterprises, but all the hopes are still maintained in the good negotiations with the uh, state ministers to develop better understanding of our uh, predicament and give us more money. So within this uh, horizon, you cannot win. Uh, nationalism is mixed with uh, anti-immigrant feeling in Turkey. Even the opposition is talking about sending back the uh, Syrians back to Turkey, back to their own countries. And <clears throat> we are building two long wars 
along the Syrian border and Iranian border, hundreds of kilometers of five meter tall concrete wall. You may check the uh, pictures from the internet. It was very interesting. It was when we're talking about in 1960s, the Berlin Wall. Now we are uh, building a kind of Chinese wall in the uh, Iran and uh, Iraqi, Iran and Syrian borders. And uh, even the opposition is talking about uh, sending the refugees back. And Turkey's reactionary politics use this as a kind of opportunity to maintain its occupation in the Syria. They suggest that they are going to take refugees from European countries as well as from Turkey and to build settlements in the Turkish occupied regions of Syria <laughs> and repatriate the Syrians there without asking anything to the uh, Syrian government or Syrian people. And this is uh, also a good news because they are going to get some credits from the European Union, etc., as they have done it uh, in the last time when they sent refugees en masse to the uh, Greek borders. And uh, in the panic, the European Union paid lots of money to Turkey to stop it. They, they are doing it the same thing. And now they are going to build or do, uh, further develop the Turkish construction industry in building small cities or towns in Syria <laughs> with the European money. And uh, while doing so, they are Greek, going to create free zones of production as well as contraband smuggling in the region. And they are going to change the uh, population uh, mix in the uh, occupied territories. Mm -hmm. And this policy is supported by the very sane and sober left-wing people, as well as the social, social democrats. And this kind of thing is called constant progressive in Turkey nowadays. And uh, for years and years, only a few people working in Istanbul for the, with the refugees and the illegal immigrants to develop their uh, own organizations and to develop their own rights, etc. Very few people. When I'm thinking about uh, what we have done in 1970s and 80s in London, I'm feeling really ashamed because some of the comrades who are listening to this meeting were there, were there for us uh, when we were the illegal immigrants in that country. And they have done unspeakable sacrifices to uh, maintain our presence there. Unspeakable because what they have done is still considered illegal in, in, in the Britain. British society today. So that's what I'm not speaking about. It. But I know what they have done, how uh, devotedly they worked for us. And not only for us, also for us, uh, Chilean comrades and uh, Palestinian comrades, Palestinian comrades have received the same treatment from the same comrades in the communist movement and in also other left wing organizations. But in Turkey, there are very few doing the same thing. There are some even people who are in the uh, European countries as refugees in 1980s and returned back after 1990 elections, etc. And they are still talking about the same language with the uh, social democrat opposition against uh, immigration, etc. I really feel ashamed for them. But that is the reality of Turkey. That's why we are unable to fight for the uh, fight with the right wing. And uh, Another important aspect of the uh, Turkish politics, we have mentioned about Kurds, but religious opposition to the uh, religious fundamentalism or the, or the religious nationalist mix is the Alevi community. It's almost one quarter of the Turkish population is Alevi. That means that they are not Orthodox, Sunni, Muslims, and they, are, they have been under oppression since 16th century, 17th century. And the latest, lately in 
1920s and then 1970s, they were subjected to massacres. In 1990s, they were subjected to massacres. So they are trying to organize their own organizations and uh, they are raising their own demands. And uh, secularist Turkish left saying that, oh no, this is not a good idea. <laughs> you are doing the same thing with the uh, religious fundamentalism. It's, there is no difference between your religious fundamentalism and between you and the religious fundamentalism. They are not seeing that the oppressed people's opposition to the regime and the uh, fundamentalist Islam's opposition to the regime. They think that they are the same thing. Or at least they are using that pretext not to support the Alevi movement, considering the Alevi movement as a kind of reaction. It's very easy to say that, of course. When you say that, you, you get, get rid of your own obligations. Then you are not able to, you are not uh, required to do anything to support Alevi community. But every five or six years once, when uh, Alevi organizations came under the fire, people are get killed, etc. And only a very, very small section of the left-wing movement is doing something about it. <laughs> These are the uh, hindrances of the Turkish left to bring change and to bring unity or to bring a program to fight with the uh, right wing. Nationalism is part of the, uh, their character traits and mild nationalism or so-called patriotism is their part of their uh, in ideology, as a result of the great sections of the uh, Turkish left, is not prepared to fight against right wing. Only Kurds and the Alevis and a few extremist left wing are prepared to fight, and under the conditions of severe punishment or severe oppression. Every day, uh, we are uh, hearing death of five, six, ten Kurdish fighters in the uh, in its occupied territories or within Turkey. And every day we are hearing a trumped up charge bring about another prominent opposition figure. And there is nobody standing by them and doing anything about it. Only we are talking ourselves and we are doing whatever we can. So that was the situation. Under that conditions, we are unable to fight with the right wing. Because a great portion of the opposition is not against far right. They are actually supporting the far right clandestinely, secretly. In their heart of hearts, they are far right people under the disguise or uh, guise of social democrats or left wing. That was the main problem. So we cannot find it. We cannot find an organization. We cannot uh, build a uh, coherent politics. Even the simple terms of democracy is not acceptable in Turkey for the left wing. I'm afraid to say uh, that uh, Turkey's left is not Democrats. But that's the, that's the truth. Turkey's, Turkey's left is no, no longer democratic. They are not radicals. They, are, they don't have any program for that regard. And all the uh, attempts to bring about a discussion for program and for more unified organization is thwarted, thwarted by the internal forces and by the state agencies, in openly or in clandestinely. They are uh, giving opportunities to organizations such as the Ishi parties or the Vatan parties nowadays, the former Maoist movement became a extreme nationalists or 
within the, as we have seen in the last elections, they are supporting Turkish Workers' Party on the hand. So the old uh, developments are getting collapsed just before the crucial moment. That's the problem. That was the main problem in front of us. Of course, this is uh, if we have a more more sociological develop more sociological research on that, you might find the uh, class reasons associated that you got. And you may know that better than me. But in practical terms, that's the situation. We are not able to get together. We are not able to get together to discuss, to develop the program, and to even find a unified position in, in, in terms of electoral politics in Turkey. Next year, there will be local elections. Last time in local elections, CHP or the Republican People's Party candidates won the major states, Istanbul, Ankara, and Izmir. But they did so with the support of the Kurdish votes. Now, after the debacle of the last elections and since the developments after the election, I don't think the Kurdish votes are ready to support the Republican People's Party once more in the elections. And if they support, they realize, unless they are forced to do it because of the circumstances, and nobody is going to support the bastards who are in power nowadays because what they have done that, well done since that, is terrible, terrible. Because whatever they criticize in the Erdogan's party's politics, they are doing the same thing. And uh, they are excluding the left from the organizations, Kurds excluded. And the rhetoric is getting more and more rabid, anti-immigrant and anti-Kurdish. So why should the Kurds support them? And if they lose the elections, then the dominance of Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his co will be uh, massive for the next 10 more years. That's the situation. I think that that's summarizes the my quite my presentation. I think it will be better if you take some questions if there if there's any. Uh, dreadful. Um, my expectation is I suspect in the short term things will get worse. I, you know because I, I just cannot see any positivity. I can't see any anywhere around the world. And if someone can tell me what it is. I'd be fascinated to hear, you know, some shaft of uh, light, uh, there it is. On the other hand, you know, in terms of what you were saying, yes, um, and maybe I missed it. I did pick stuff up about trade union struggles and uh, the question of um, uh, fighting um, for um, pay rises. But you do have that in capitalism, which is, you know, never ceases. I the struggle in the workplace, the struggle of the proletariat against the boss. And I know uh, that can be just economistic and just trade unionist. Nevertheless, that's a permanent state of affairs, which the left historically based themselves on. And in that sense, then politically equip uh, that movement uh, with a greater vision. Uh, and, and I'm not saying uh, that trade unionism uh, is the answer. But I mean, certainly, uh, just to finish, in terms of Britain, and again, I'm not dressing it up like some communists on the left have done. You know, we have seen this uh, upsurge in uh, trade union struggles against pay cuts. Uh, it, needs to, uh, it needs to be uh, emphasised. Yes, the strikes have been very much along the lines of protest strikes, but given the you know, the situation of the world and the British economy, that isn't going to go away. Um, and when you look at uh, Iran, when you look at Turkey, when you look at France, when you look at Germany, that is a permanent state of affairs. And the working class in that sense is forced into struggle. And if it doesn't succeed, it's still forced and forced and forced again um, um, into struggle. I'm not saying that in some sort of, oh, well, all we need to do is turn the corner. 
nonetheless, uh, I do think, you know, simply the existence of the two main classes in capitalist society, the capitalist class, which relies on exploitation and surplus value, but also the working class. Um, so that was, that was all.